Feel the love? Well, open your hearts, open your minds to our Reverend John the Beloved, who is bringing you the message this morning. Please welcome him. So are you ready to feel the love? I'm not convinced. Let's say I'm ready to be the love. Oh, wow. Give it to me again. I'm ready to be the love. Now open yourself like this and just say, I am ready to be the love. See, Tia, take it. I'm ready to be the love. See, Tia, take it. Good morning, family. I think I better resort to the proper English. <laughs> and a joy to add my own words of welcome to my absolutely open heart to all of you within the sound of my voice, both here at the beautiful Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living and to those who join us on the World Wide Web. And special welcome to our visitors. So happy to have you. Well, February is Love Month, and we just said we're ready. And I've titled my encouragement this morning, Conscious Partnering. I've been thinking about this business of partnering a lot. We're doing a, a class on Thursday mornings on practical mysticism, and one of the things we're doing is trying to deepen our, our connection with the divine, with that special, very special essence within us that is the purity and the beauty of God's absolutely wonderful and amazing love. And so I think partnering, partnering with the divine, partnering with God. And then how does that affect our partnering with other human beings as well? Not just in love partnerships, but just generally in our lives and in our affairs. But as you know, men and women um, have, I think, slightly different takes on partnering, I believe. And a friend sent me a joke which makes the point better, I think, than I can make it about how some of we uh, men, and I'm talking particularly about Jamaican men, but it may apply across the board, how we think about partnering. You want to hear it? Yes. <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> so there's this devoted wife whose husband has been slipping in and out of a coma for weeks, and all this time she sat dutifully by his bedside. When he finally came to, he, he motioned her to come closer. He said, come, come dear, come closer. And as she sat on the bedside, uh, he said, you know, honey, you've been with me through all the bad times. When me went bankrupt and lost my business, you stood by my side. When me got shot, you did there by my side. When we lost the house, you was there. When my car crashed and me broke up, you was there. When my health started to fail, you was there. And when I started to get worse, you was there. All the time, you was there, right by my side. You was there. I want a divorce. <laughs> the stunned wife exclaimed, but you're not easy. I've been with you by your side through thick and thin, and you want a divorce? To which the husband retorts, yes, me want a divorce. You know, she say you are the bad luck. <laughs> you are the crosses. For every single time something happened, you did dead day. You were there. It's only a joke on us Jamaican men, but the scenario may be familiar. Many of us, like the good wife in the story, put our own needs, our own desires, our own hopes, our own dreams, and our aspirations on hold to wait hand and foot on someone else. We allow the whims and wants of our children, our partners, even our friends sometimes, to take precedence over our own desires and what we really want out of life. I think I may have shared with you how many, many years ago when my precious mom, Daisy, was still on this plane of activity and living with me, 
I would buy all the delicious delicacies that she loved. And then I would fix her gourmet suppers. Really, you know, she would have smoked marlin or baked crab backs with feta salad, you know. It was wonderful. And when she had been looked after, I would rummage around in the fridge for the leftovers of what we ate yesterday for dinner or sometimes several days ago. And I would fish out the soggy salad or the day it really hit me was, there was like two spoons of stew peas left and I poured some water on it to make soup. <laughs> Ever done it? It's quite nice actually. But I, I thought to myself, you know, you would never give this to Daisy or her caregiver. Uh, but you always give yourself the leftovers. In Jamaica, what we call the Walef. Friends, I swear I heard the voice of our founding minister and my teacher and spiritual mother, Dr. Elma Lumsden, say, just, uh, just a minute, John Deere. Do you deserve the best? And I thought, wow, you know, I have a fridge full of goodies. And I still never think of giving myself the very best. And I wondered if that was something that I was doing in my life generally, you know. And is it something that we all do? You know, you save the best china for when visitors come and the best glasses and all of everything that's your very finest gets pulled out for other people. But what do you do? You eat out of a... <laughs> and those styrofoam things that they call coffin boxes. You know, they call them coffin boxes. Those long, narrow, styrofoam, ugly things. So, if you resonate with this picture, my friends, that I have painted of shortchanging yourself in your relationships while lavishing the best on your significant others, you need to remind yourself right here and now as we begin Love Month that you are the beloved child of the living spirit almighty and that you deserve all the good that was prepared for you from before the beginning of time. And when it says the table of life is spread before you, it's a buffet and you don't need to sit down and say, why is everybody else getting up and um, helping themselves to the, the wonderful things while I'm sitting here saying, I only have crumbs. Get up and help yourself. Leftovers are the perfect metaphor for the way many of us live our lives. We often serve ourselves leftovers of our own time while lavishing the gourmet time on others. And my example is the, the way shower, the beautiful Jesus, who always took time apart. If you notice in, this, in the Bible, there are many places where it says he took time to go off by himself. In Matthew 14, 23, we read, and I quote, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. End of that scripture. When last have you been, or have you taken the time to be alone with yourself, with your God, with your thoughts, just being with that inner presence and power that is so close to you that it's nearer than your very neck vein. You see, friends, we need quality time for ourselves. 19th century American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson said, and I quote, guard well your spare moments. They are like uncut diamonds. Discard them and their value will never be known. Improve them, and they will become the brightest gems in a useful life. Spare moments, bright gems in a useful life. If you use them, not just for watching television and the latest brouhaha and bad news, but spending time in the sanctuary of your heart, quietly listening, listening for the still small voice that unerringly directs your footsteps upon the perfect path because you are its beloved. Which brings me to your assignment. Visitors, I'm happy to tell you that 
whenever I speak, I give my audience an assignment. Am I right, church? Yes, yes. And if I forget, they remind me. Good students. So, your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is in two parts. First of all, this week, I want you to schedule some gourmet time for yourself. That's time to be with yourself. Time to pamper yourself and time to build a conscious partnership with God, with the God of your own understanding. Maybe you can spend that time really just contemplating what is this God presence to me? How does it feel? How does it show up in my life and in my relationships and in the way I operate in life? What is the God truly of my understanding? Who or what is this presence and power that we talk about week after week, that we pray to and of sometimes? What is this thing, this thing at the center of my soul, which is more than I am, and which is the power in the universe which I can use, and even more importantly, which can use me? And so this week, your assignment is to spend time by yourself building this conscious, conscious partnership with the divine. Mary Manning Morrissey, in her book, No Less Than Greatness, uh, has an, a, a, an enjoyable, it's an enjoyable and inspiring manual on conscious partnering. And in it, she recommends as a powerful spiritual practice that we spend an entire day with God. Wow. Let me read you what she says. Quote, spend one day with God. This is absolutely private between you and your creator. Nobody else knows that God walks with you as a companion throughout this day. But it makes all the difference in the world. As God moves from the background of your life to the foreground of your life, Everyday experiences become holy experiences, unquote. Morrissey goes on to recommend that when we shower, bathing can be a sacrament, just like baptism. Bathing can be a time to become not just physically clean, but to allow your thoughts to become clean with God. So as you shower, simply affirm, I bathe myself in appreciation. Can we say that together? I bathe myself in appreciation. Thank you, God, for my body temple. Thank you, God, for my body temple. You see how many times we're in the shower and we're thinking, oh, God, I'm running late already. And we're already at the office or we're already doing what we're supposed to be doing later on in the day. Can we just be present in the moment to feel that water over our bodies and to just say, I bathe myself in appreciation. Thank you, God, for my body temple. And as part of your spiritual practice, as you pay attention to your feet in the shower, and are reminded that, that you know, from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, it is all God. Remind yourself that wherever you stand this day is holy ground. And as you wash your hands, remind yourself that every time you touch someone, it's God touching them through you. And as you brush your teeth, resolve to speak to others with love and speak of others in ways that are pure and loving and wholesome and true. Tall order? Well, I have a special gift for you, which Carol mentioned earlier. Ash Wednesday this week offers you the opportunity to spend your day with God. It's a perfect day to spend time with God, and our retreat here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living will provide a perfect scenario and setting for treating yourself, treating yourself, pun intended, to this real gourmet time with God. Our theme for the day, as Carol said, is be still and know. 
And we have designed a day of spiritual communion with exercises that will help you to actively access the attributes of God in all their color and their beauty and their richness. So it's going to be a wonderful day, beginning at 6 in the morning with a sunrise meditation for those of you who are early morning people like myself, and I know who those are. And there are those who can't make it up at, for 6 in the morning, but will come later in the day. Here's a little thing I want you to do for me, though. Whatever time you plan to come to the temple on Ash Wednesday, give yourself an extra half hour, because I want you, as the first act that you do when you arrive at the temple, is to walk the labyrinth in silence, beginning that deepening of, your, of the, the presence, centering in the presence. So whatever time you're coming, add a half an hour to it and become prepared to walk the labyrinth. In Morris's day with God uh, exercise, she advises that at mealtime, we imagine that we are dining with God at the table. Well, if you're consciously relating to whomever you're dining with as God, this becomes really easy. But the added bonus is you are less likely to rush. You are less likely to turn on the TV and ingest the bad news along with your food, or to interrupt your communion, that's your common union, to make a call or send a text message. The result will therefore be more meaningful communication with those close to you. So make an effort to sit down with family or friends or loved ones and really enjoy a meal, to be present in the moment and enjoy the meal together, knowing that you are dining or you are eating or that you are sharing a meal with God. Finally, when driving, be consciously aware of God in the car as you and with you. In addition, remind yourself that every other motorist on the road and every pedestrian and every cyclist is God. Strange as it may seem, commuting is often a time when people are distanced from their highest selves. Not so strange, eh? It's the time when you really cuss two Christian bad word and <laughs> give people the Hawaiian blessing and just generally, you know, step outside yourself. Sometimes you might find yourself saying things that you wouldn't you wouldn't normally say. There's a, a wonderful story about a, 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 a lady who um, came to the stop sign and it was yellow, you know, and so she, she thought, it you know, it goes through your mind in a flash, I, I, I can make it, but she decided to do the correct thing on the yellow, on the amber and stop. So the lady behind her screeched her heart because she was hoping to screech you and go through too, you know, which would have been the red light. And then shortly thereafter, a police car drew up flashing lights, took the lady in the car behind pulled her over, checked her documents, and then took her to the police station for questioning and for a breathalyzer. So she said, I don't understand you, I stopped. And he said, yes, but I, you know, I, I, I tell you what happened, lady. What would Jesus do was on one bumper. I drive with God was another bump, on another bumper. Um, I am God's perfect child was another sticker on the side of your car. And I thought, no, you know, you really must have stolen this car. Because, <laughs> because the amount of bad was just saying the lady who didn't speech it through in front of her. <laughs> in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, author Stephen Covey tells a story of a young man, a strong young man, who decided to, to try his hand as a woodcutter. And so he applied to a timber merchant, and of course he got the job. Big strapping youth, you know. His boss gave him an ax and showed him the area where he was to work. On the first day, the young woodcutter brought 18 trees. Wow, congratulations, the boss said. Keep this up and you'll go a far way. And very motivated by the boss's words, the woodcutter tried harder the next day, but he could only bring 15 trees. The third day he tried even harder, but he could only bring 10 trees. And day after day, he was bringing less and less trees. I must be losing my strength, he thought. And he went to the boss and apologized and said, 
He couldn't understand what was going on. The first day I did so well, I brought 18 trees, and now I'm down to seven. When was the last time you sharpened your ax? The boss asked. Sharpen? I had no time to sharpen my ax. I have been too busy trying to cut trees, the young woodcutter said. Friends, our lives are like that. Sometimes we get so busy that we don't, don't take time to sharpen the ax. As Kobe writes, and I quote in today's world, it seems that everyone is busier than ever, but less happy than ever. Why is that? Could it be that we have forgotten how to stay sharp? There's nothing wrong, my friends, with activity and hard work, but we should not get so busy that we neglect the truly important things in life, like taking time to get close to our creator, giving more time to family, taking time for reading and recreation, and silent listening within, and of course, prayer. We all need time to relax, to think and meditate, to learn and to grow. If we don't take the time to sharpen the ax, we'll certainly become dull and lose our effectiveness. In our Thursday morning class, as I mentioned to you, Practical Mysticism, we've been working on practicing the presence by pausing frequently during our day to affirm, I am centered in God and God is centered in me. It's a good affirmation for sharpening your ax. I am centered in God and God is centered in me. Can we say that together? I am centered in God and God is centered in me. Put your hand on your heart and say it in a half voice. I am centered in God, and God is centered in me. Say it in a whisper. I am centered in God, God is centered in me. And now say it in your heart silently. Feel the energy shift? Did you take it down? Yes. Friends, this teaching known as the science of mind equips us with the tools we need to live happy, healthy, and fulfilling lives. The tools to sharpen our acts. You can build a conscious partnership with God in every area of your life, and when you do, I assure you that both your intimate as well as your casual relationships will glorify God. Let us say, my intimate and my casual relationships all glorify God. Can we say that? My intimate and my casual relationships all glorify God. So ask yourself, am I treating myself with the same love and consideration I give to others? Am I allocating to myself the leftovers of my own precious self, the leftovers of my own precious time? Indeed, am I giving myself the leftovers of my precious God-given life? And if your answer is yes, make the commitment today in every domain of your life to throw out the leftovers and bring on the gourmet goodies which you so richly deserve as a member of the royal household of God. Throw out the leftover salad, whether it be soggy lettuce or wilted outworn ideas. Pour the old soup off, I'm not good enough. I should have, I would have, I could have. Throw it down the garbage disposal, and as you do, affirm out aloud, I deserve the best because I am the best. Can we say that? I deserve the best because I am the best. I am in conscious partnership with God. Together, I am in conscious partnership with God. So let us turn to our neighbor and say, you deserve the best because you are the best. You are in conscious partnership with God. Namaste. You deserve the best because you are the best. You are in conscious partnership with God. You deserve the best, guys.
I said, say to your neighbor, not the whole church. <laughs> My friends, you deserve the best because trust me, you are the best. And I honor and revere and love it that you are in conscious partnership with God. God loves you and so do I. Namaste.